Hello, everyone. Yet once again, it's another day of fresh grace and mercy. This is the Guilt, Grace, Gratitude podcast sponsored by Logos Bible Software, where we bridge the gap to Reformed Christian theology for your listening pleasure. And today we're on a season for the Reformed Church. We're doing the finale episode. So we are doing the final episode, if you don't know what finale means, (laughs) of this season. But we're going to also talk about Uh, what we have coming for season five, and a little bit of reminders about season three. And of course, to do the content of uh, this finale episode, uh, reflecting on season four, the Reformed Church, we're going to do some Q&A. We're going to talk about our favorite episodes. We'll briefly remind you guys the layout and um, structure and episodes that we had, and just some uh, comments here and there about them. So, and reminders of where to go to if um, uh, based on uh, the content that we had. So we'll do a little reflection on that as well. Hopefully it won't be too long of an episode. I know there's a lot to cover. So we'll jump in. Uh, just a reminder of, for you guys on the show notes, uh, we need to worship our holy God the way he prescribes us to do so. And in scripture, he tells us to uh, do that in person at a local church. So we do need to find a church to go to, call home, be a member of. Um, When How you could do that, if you don't have a church right now that's confessional or reformed, which means takes the Bible serious as true gospel teaching, administers the sacraments, and also has a law gospel distinction, uh, go to the link on our show notes to find the closest reformed churches near you. You click that link. Type in your zip code, type in a zip code of somebody that you know that you want to refer a church to, and the closest reformed denominations pop up. So we have the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, the OPC. We have the URC, which is the United Reformed Church. We have the PCA. Uh, We have a lot of other denominations that are reformed. We have confessional churches, too. So if you're a confessional Baptist, we still love you. And you could go to one of those churches as well. And of course, if you're near Santa Ana, please check out Peter's church. He's church planning right now. You can contact him and ask him. It's going to be a formed church. So you're going to get what you've been learning through our podcast and know the confidence that you're getting the gospel distinction on a weekly basis and getting Um, all the stuff that a Reformed Church would uh, promise to give you. So contact Peter. You can email him. Uh, It's um, Santa Ana Reformed. It's near the Water Tower in Santa Ana, California. You can also get a hold of us just when it comes specifically to the podcast itself. We're on Twitter and Instagram and YouTube and email, of course. So guiltgracepod at gmail.com. You can also find us on YouTube. It's pretty easy. Just type in Guilt, Grace, Gratitude Podcast. Subscribe to us. You see a lot of our video content. We're still in the works of uploading some videos slash maybe just audio. (laughs) Got to figure out how to do that from seasons past, episodes past, especially season two, which is phenomenal um, to try to get it up there. But it's still on our um, podcast catchers uh, no matter what podcast catcher you have you can get a hold of us on twitter and instagram at guilt grace pod same handle for both and then also uh please if you feel the need to want to give us some uh financial ability to move this podcast forward and help us out we'd love that uh we have what's called a bridge builder um you click that patreon link you can have different levels of how to know to become a bridge builder bridge builders are really just what we call uh, anybody that gives us financial means to run our show Uh, we've been doing this free for quite a while Um, we're at the point where we're growing fast enough and big enough where we could need to increase some bandwidth and figure out some uh, housekeeping things and things in the background of editing and takes a lot of time so we need those funds and things like that so if you go to Patreon, you can uh, individually give if you're a company or anything like that, you can uh, give as well. Um, in the middle of this episode, you'll hear some words from our sponsors. Lagos Bible Software is our uh, official sponsor right now. 
We also have some other book publishers that are sponsoring us as well. You'll hear their, a word from them in the middle of the show. And so, uh, yeah, I think we'll jump into this episode and uh, I'll take a little breath and let <laughs> Peter talk. How are you, Peter? <laughs> Doing good. I was uh, just telling Nick before this, I'm, I'm learning, we, we have a new puppy, so I'm learning how to take care of the puppy. I've, I've, had, a, I've had two dogs growing up, so I, I know, relatively speaking, how to take care of a dog. But this dude is a, is a, is a nibbler. He's not a biter. He's like a nibbler. Um, so usually yeah. during an episode, either he's asleep or he bites me. It's one of those two things where like he nibbles on me. So I've learned today I have to take him on a long walk and then tire the heck out of him. Um, so now he's chewing on a bone about two feet in front of me. Um, but yeah, other than that, preparing for sermons, um, yeah, helping the gym. I still program workouts for the gym back in San Diego. Um, so yeah, life is full. Life is good. Uh, yeah, thanking the Lord for what He's done, and also thanking yeah. the Lord for what He's done for season four, um, which was a really, really cool and fun season for us to do. To dive into the various aspects of the Reformed Church. If you guys have never been to one, and I know, like for me, even though I went to a Reformed seminary, um, it can still be. I wouldn't say like scary. It could just be like walking into the unknown. Like what, what am I walking into? Like I, I have a relative idea of what it's like to walk into a non-denominational church. And for non-Christians, that can still be in a, in a scary unknown realm too. So hopefully what this did is yeah. maybe make it a little bit less unknown, a little bit less scary to, to darken the doors and say like, you know, I, I, I may not know precisely what happens at this church, but at least I have some bearings walking into here so that was that was kind of our goal mm -hmm. behind the season yeah wet the appetite of what you'll see experience taste feel um yeah. and being honest and upfront about some things that we could do better yeah absolutely um, yeah well like yeah we'll we'll talk about some of those things in the q a portion of this um but yeah it's i think it's uh it's helpful too because in e even in i think really good reformed churches you don't Sometimes and I've, I've, I think I've preached it enough to know kind of some of their practices. Um, you don't every week get an expl explanation of each thing that they do or why they do it or um, how the confessions relate to the church or the government, all that stuff. Not like the public or U.S. government, but the government of the church. Um, yeah, I, th I don't think it's, it's not all the time or not every time. There's not always a class to tell you like, hey, this is why we do what we do. They just do it. So maybe this is a helpful, like, this is why we do what we do. Um, and if you guys go to Reformed Church, uh, listening to this and say, okay, I now, I now see why they do this. Um, even if it's not explicitly explained each Sunday from the pulpit or from an elder or whoever it may be. Yeah, definitely. Um, going into what would you like to cover first? We got Q&A. We had some questions that we asked people on Twitter uh, have a handful of those. We can also reflect on um, each of the episodes. Uh, we can actually, maybe to make it a chronological linear kind of thing, we can actually start this episode, maybe talking about the top five episodes of season three, Promises and Fulfillments, Walking Through the Covenant Theology Book by Crossway and RTS Faculty. Yeah, why don't we, yeah, maybe just talk about for season four, maybe if you want to bring up like your favorites three episodes and why they're your favorite. And I'll, I'll start on this and then we can move from here to the, to the Q and a, um, and maybe cover a little gotcha. more four as well. Um, cause for season four, I mean, I think, so we had my pastor, we had a bunch of people on uh, and I was trying to think like, without being just like, Oh, the latest episode was my favorite. Um, cause we, we've just, I mean, we're recording this on Friday, July 22nd. We've recorded basically everything from season four, from season four already. So it's all, a lot of the newer stuff is fresher on my mind than some of the older yeah. stuff. Um, but regardless, um, I loved recording the preaching of the gospel episode with Dr. Mm. Jim Kim. Um, that was, that I think a, like that was just encouraging like that was just an encouraging episode first and foremost even yeah. like not to mention the content that he was describing um that was just an encouraging episode and 
he's my former professor now the president of gospel coalition um and he just he loves the gospel and he loves preaching the gospel and if there's anything i think that most marks the reformed church and it's part of the marks of the church which is why we had preaching the gospel it's it's the first of the three marks and it's in it's westminster confession of faith my gut says it's chapter 25 and i could be wrong on that but it's Belgian confession article 29 and it talks about the three uh, the three marks of the reformed church and so somebody asks you what is a church you can say okay this is what a church is it preaches the gospel it administers the sacraments and it administers the pure, it purely administers church discipline, both positive and negatively. So, which is why we had preaching the gospel in this. This is something that, like, I think very distinctly marks the Reformed Church. It's less so, not to say it doesn't do, but it's less so like moral imperatives. Hey, do this, or better way to do this, or good advice for doing this. But it's first and foremost, this is who Christ is, what He's done for you. Um, and now you live in light of this. And I think the Reformed Church, if anything, is most distinctive for that stuff. I don't, what, what did you think of Dr. Kim's episode? Oh, it's super helpful. Just knowing he is really, um, this is like his wheelhouse. Yeah, he, he taught preaching at West, uh, Westminster for yeah. 21 years before taking the post at Gospel Coalition. Yeah, and I just, I watched a lot of like youtube videos of him talking about that same subject yep, yep. um before we recorded and it was just it was it was a very healthy good conversation um just reminding i mean very practical and applicable for you but for me as a member of the church a layman uh where is most of our audience most of our audience is not pastors obviously members of the church and congregants vastly outnumber church leaders oh, yeah. so um just ex hearing what he had to say um by me being on the other side of the pulpit being in the in the congregation in the pew so um knowing what is going through you guys's head on yeah. a week-to-week -week basis not just a sunday morning it's it's right after uh, monday through <laughs> saturday night what it's you're like, really doing to prepare like Sunday afternoon through Saturday night. That's all we're yeah. thinking about is either we're being told either in a nice way or not so nice way, um, what we did right or wrong. And then we think about th that through the week and we're preparing for the next week. Yeah, no, that's, that's a good point. Uh, pastors have an incredibly hard and incredibly important job. Um, and you know, we are not, none of us are perfect. Even if we are in Christ right now on this side of heaven, we're still not perfect. So um, it's a good reminder of making sure the pastor is staying in their boundaries of teaching the law gospel distinction, being true to scripture, not being heretical on anything. But outside of that, really give your pastor some grace and thank him for preaching the gospel. Um, I, what I've been doing personally as a uh, just kind of like a, a, a practice of appreciation is after every sermon, I go up to Pastor Morsh and I say, thank you for preaching the gospel. And like, at the very least, I could just say, thank you for doing that. That's what I needed. And yeah. he's like, praise God, happy to do it. And then he's just kind of like, we have a chat about <laughs> something, but yeah. I at the very least need to um, do that. And so Thank you, Peter, for, you know, stepping up and being, uh, working on being a pastor. And um, so it's, it's an important thing. You guys are uh, messengers of God's word and uh, us members of the church, even though we're not uh, church officers or anything like that, uh, in our day-to-day -day lives, we still have the responsibility of representing God's word too. So I think a lot of us members kind of forget about that. We're like, well, that's the pastor's job. That's the church leader's job. I'll just go focus on my secular nine to five, Monday through Friday, have fun on Saturday. And then I'll squeeze in an hour or two church in the morning. It's like, no, uh, we are called as God's people to represent him and be ambassadors of him throughout the week, 24 seven. Yeah. So, so anyway, kind of went off topic a little bit there, but I <laughs> no. think. That's good stuff. 
I think I wasn't prepared for this question of picking uh, my favorite and just like trying to recap and, and scroll through them. I brought it up. I'm going to throw you off. I was throwing a 12 6 yeah, curveball, right. Clayton Kershaw. See if you can hit it. Yeah. Well, I was a line drive hitter. Yeah. I won't hit a home run. I didn't hit many home runs, but I was a line drive hitter. So I'll get a nice, solid, sharp answer, but uh, it won't be like <laughs> blown in. It won't be that impressive, maybe. Gotcha. So, um, well, because I was a home run hitter with a very low average. <laughs> So it's either, either I hit it really hard and really far, or I didn't hit it at all. That kind of goes with your pitching too. You threw it hard, but you didn't I, I know. Threw, I threw it was very strong. hard, but yeah, that's, I was, I was feared throughout little league and like my first year of high school, because I threw harder than everybody else by a lot, but either like the joke that my dad always made, cause like a lot of parents who were watching us, but like my kids terrified of Peter. Because either he hits you, he walks you, or he strikes you out. Yeah. And you know, like we're never terribly sure what, like which one's gonna happen. So yeah, yeah that's, that's me saying, you know, that's it's good that we have these two different personalities. Yeah, and then for hitting, you either sounds like you said like you either strike out or hit a home run. <laughs> yeah, I where either, yeah, either you feared catching it or you're like, he's not gonna do anything. For me, I um, had a batting average didn't hit hardly any home runs but i hit a lot of doubles a lot of singles good amount of triples i was kind of like one of those guys yep um but anyway going into our conversation um i have instagram in front of me so it's a helpful guide of me reminding me of the the whole season yep. so i'd say starting off our confessional roots was episode one i think that that first episode of every season is just a lot of weight on it because we have to lay out what we're expecting, what we're wanting to achieve, our mission. And it goes, the whole point of the Reformed Church is honoring our confessional roots. Yep. So we did, we brought up our creeds, confessions, and catechisms a little bit. And then priming you for, you did a good job of like uh, scheduling this season because it did work through this stuff, which I think you scheduled it based off of Hyde's book, right? Yeah, more, yeah, it was like... 75 percent off of his book and i took some creative liberties okay cool so yeah after confessional roots which is like you guys would listen to you understand what the uh, season is going to be about we jumped right in um to talking about the the heidelberg catechism with scott clark you can't beat our scott clark he crushed it as usual i think we asked him one question let him talk for two hours <laughs> yeah. just exaggerating obviously maybe it's two questions and 45 minutes whatever but it's not, he, yeah, he he's not much, exaggerating now much it's not too far off the truth yeah he, he explained everything you need to know pretty much within a podcast episode of the heidelberg catechism he joke amongst students at westminster if you want if you if either like if you don't want dr clark to lecture ask him a question because he <laughs> forgets about his lecture and then continues asking your question and then halfway yeah. through the semester, he realizes, like, oh, no, I'm really far behind. And all the students are like, we know because we asked you questions. <laughs> he, yeah, he spent a semester answering that first question that somebody oh, had. Yes. Yep. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we go from the Heidelberg Catechism, and then we went to the Belgic Confession uh, with uh, your pastor, uh, Dan, Daniel Hyde. And then he did the Canons of Dort, too. Mm -hmm. So we got the three forms of unity there, there, that was a really good understanding. And then we had my pastor come on the Westminster standards, John Morsh. And so there's three, three Westmin, there's one Westminster standard and kind of like the three forms of unity, there's three types of Westminster standards. So they got the Westminster confession, the shorter catechism, the larger catechism. He talked about that. So after that episode, you had the three forms of unity and the Westminster standards, the history, what they are, why they were written. Um, and then being reformed, we're all about scripture. We're going back to the scripture, going back to the early church fathers. Um, and so the next couple episodes really talked about that. The next three episodes talked about that. Um, then we talked about the, the law and the gospel, the three uses of the law. Three uses of the law was um, very helpful and eye-opening. Um, and then justification, sanctification, can't beat doctrines like that, just that are biblical and reformed. 
Mm-hmm. There's never if, if it's a if it's a reformed doctrine, it's a biblical doctrine. That sounds pretty dogmatic to say, but that's the whole point of the Reformation. We're not making up new things. We didn't. John Calvin didn't make up justification. It was actually something that was embedded in Scripture, and he just went to it. And even even theologians after the Bible, before Calvin, were talking about justification. Yeah. So we we recap that five solas, three marks of the church, preaching the gospel you talked about with Julius Kim. What I really liked is the baptism and Lord's Supper. Mm -hmm. Um, Then we start really getting into some uh, conversations that could turn into debates. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, obviously we, I want to make this clear. We really appreciate and we come alongside our confessional and reformed Baptist brothers and sisters. I get it. Like we, we disagree on some stuff, especially with baptism, um, you know, baby baptism or not. Um, but we, they still are true, true believers. Um, we, we hold to why we strongly think in scripture, why they why babies are introduced into a new, better covenant, um, and why improving that. But, um, you know, that was a loving conversation where there is debate on the other side. Uh, we would agree on the Lord's Supper. You know, it's pretty much across the board. Believers take the Lord's Supper. And then exercise of church discipline, the regulative principle of worship, uh, then biblical worship with Adriel Sanchez. Loved that episode. He um, always is super <clears throat> clear. He, he's also, he hosts Core Christianity, mm-hmm. which is a very helpful podcast to go through like just random questions listeners call in and have. Yep. Um, and he doesn't prepare for those questions too. He gets them live. So when he answers them, mm, that's, that's off the cuff. And he, he knows liturgy so well. He's the guy that's, to go to. That's his thing. Yeah. When Westminster, when we had a, we didn't have a, con- we had a lecture series on liturgy and this was maybe a year and a half ago. I forget when it was, um, but it was Adriel Sanchez and another pastor in Temecula of an OPC church and his name, somebody probably knows he's, he's um, Providence OPC. The name escapes me, um, but they're both great, what we call liturgists, which just means like crafting a worship service. And what I loved what, yeah, what you're saying, Adriel is like, it's not the, it's not a question of, well, this church has liturgy and this doesn't it's, how well crafted is your liturgy and how biblical is your liturgy? Mm. Uh, which is what I think the reformed church again does really well is you walk into reformed church and more likely than not, you're going to have a well-crafted well thought out liturgy that brings you through the law of gospel distinction and, and preaches to you um, that you were a, a saved sinner under Christ. So I, yeah, again, I loved what Adriel said. Yeah, that's uh, one of the Reformed Church's main strengths is our church worship structure and our liturgy. Yep. Um, The the episode of the Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs was actually kind of a sleeper episode for me. Um, I mean, I should have expected that it wouldn't be a sleeper. (laughs) I mean, how are you a sleeper when there's songs going on? But (laughs) I, I, I mean, I didn't, I didn't think about it much, right? I didn't think about it much going into the episode. I was like, oh, this sounds kind of like, you know, we're going to talk about, you know, Psalms, whatever. Really old. So yeah. But actually it was a very enriching conversation that really reminded me of how truly beautiful and holy uh, God gives us songs to sing and not taking anything away from com- contemporary Christian music, which is beautiful yep. to read, or I mean, to listen to oh, okay. um, some, I mean, some of it, but yeah, but, <laughs> uh, but, but the, God, we only have so much time in a worship service. You might as well sing the songs that he gives us. So yeah, there's a um, comments. Now I actually know how to say his name because he told me, Plez Evans. It's not please, yeah. it's Plez, which I, Plez. Uh, yeah, a few weeks ago, but he, he pointed out, I don't know if his, his church practices somebody or exclusive somebody, whatever, but it's, there's always a fear, I think, from both congregants and pastors on how theologically rich and how true to the Bible is this song? And you like a great thing about the Psalms or scripture songs, not scripture songs, like based on scripture, but actually like in scripture songs um, is you don't have to worry about the theology because it's, it's Holy spirit inspired. So it's like 
It's yeah. perfect theology. When you when you sing it, it's perfect theology. Yeah, there's no debate about, oh, this guy interpreted it this way, um, yeah. you know, after the Bible and made this song, um, even if yeah, it sounds really nice. And that's like you said, that's a distinctive, again, of the Reformed Church. Um, and most of our church orders, I'm pretty sure the OPC, BCL, which is just Book of Church Order, I'm pretty sure it says the same thing as the URC, Book of Church Order. I don't know about the PCA as, as well as I haven't read that one as much as I had the other two, yeah. but they both say um, not even like, I think the mistake is like a majority of Psalms. It actually says principal Psalm singing. So it says, and I like, I like what Dr. Clark says. And a few other people say this is you first go to the Psalms for your singing. That should, that should comprise a majority of your songs. And if for some reason you can't find something in the Psalms, it means A, you're not looking hard enough. B, then you go to him. Then you go to those things that for whatever reason you can't find in the Psalms. Um, but those should not comprise the biggest portion. So like at Santa Ana Reformed, we, we actually don't sing any hymns. We sing only Psalms and scripture songs. People, we, what we sing, New Testament songs. So Song of Simeon, Song of Mary, um, Song of Zechariah. We sing the Trinitarian hymn. We sing, we will sing pretty soon, the song from Philippians 2. Um, so yeah, it's like, why would you not sing this stuff? It's just more scripture in your service. Yeah, and my church, which is an OPC, we do the Psalter hymnal, and there's all the Psalms in there, all 150 of them, and then yep. the hymns, and it's a unifying Psalter hymnal, I believe it. Yeah, with the U, uh, URC, correct? Where there's the three forms. Joint effort, yep. Yeah, because in the back of it, um, there are the uh, lower C Catholic, you know, creeds, confessions, um, you know, the Nicene Creed, uh, Nicene Creed and uh, Apostles Athanasian's Creed, Creed Apostles Creed. Yep. Creed. Um, and then there's also the Westminster Standards and there's well as the three forms of unity in there. So obviously in the OPC, uh, well, the, the three forms of unity are more of a URC thing and the uh, Westminster Standards are more of an OPC thing. So they combined them. Is that correct? Did I say that right? Yeah, yeah. And they're, it's not to say like they're different. They just have like yeah. slightly different emphases. But I think your pastor, John, said this. They like agreed 99.99% of the time. <clears throat> it's just a few church government things are different in the yeah. Westminster standards versus the Heidelberg. Um, and I think sometimes, whether rightly or wrongly, I, I think there's there's somewhat of a case to be made, although it can't be made that strongly, is the Heidelberg tends to be the more pastoral catechism mm -hmm. versus the Westminster tends to be more like theologically driven. It doesn't mean mm -hmm. either one doesn't have the other. It's just there's a slight emphasis towards one. But yeah, it's, there's, there's no disagreement. There's just an emphasis. Yeah. Um, so that's, yeah, what was yeah, after that's Psalms and wisdom, or it's not Psalms and wisdom, Psalms and with Psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. What was the next episode after that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And before I mention that, that's something I almost forgot is uh, something that was nice that John kind of mentioned. Um, but it's a good reminder that uh, continental reformed is more of like in the terms of, you know, because we're talking about the three forms of unity. Continental Reformed, where like the URC branched from, right? And uh, then the there's the yeah. more the, the right. continental. So that's the, like continental is like the umbrella. Yeah. Um, and URC comes from the CRC, technically, which is an American, like American denomination. Still not continental. Yeah. Um, yeah, continental means comes from the continent. Comes from comes from Britain, Europe, that area. Um, yeah, so it's, yeah, we would, you also would trace the roots through the Dutch Reformed, um, really from like 1830 something, I think was when the CRC was founded, although like the Dutch CRC, which I forget the name of it. Um, but yeah, that's, yeah, that's continental versus Presbyterial or like Scottish or whatever you want to call it, because um, they would generally trace their lineage to Knox. Yeah. Um, generally speaking, I know there's offshoots and whatnot, but yeah, <clears throat> doesn't mean they're different. Just means there's different emphases. That's what I mean is I think that comes up as a very good 
question uh, to to uh, go to answer for this season um, because people are thinking, and sometimes it, it was hard for a while to even answer. Is like, okay, you say you're reformed, but then you keep talking about you're Presbyterian, hmm. and we talk about the OPC is um, Orthodox Presbyterian Church, and so we have the Westminster Standards, and we're more of a, like you said, more the you know Scottish you know, uh, English type of heritage up there, the British islands. And then you got the continental reformed, which is more of like Dutch and kind of mainland Europe continent versus British Isles. Yeah. So, so that, that's actually an organic question here. I think it'd be really good answer for this season. And we kind of already partially answered it. What's the difference between reformed and Presbyterian? That's a big question. Um, I think that would, yeah, it would require a longer episode. Than, oh, gotcha. Yeah, than my answer. But in, yeah, in general, it's they're they're not mutually exclusive terms. They're just different emphases. If you come from a more explicitly Presbyterian government um, or Westminster standards, not versus, but like kind of in correlation to a more continental, whether it be Dutch or a Korean or whatever it is. Um, yeah, there's more than just OPC versus URC. There's KPCA, there's Spanish churches, there's Brazilian Presbyterian Church, there's the, I think there's a Presbyterian, Presbyterian Church in Russia, um, there's the Lutheran. So there's, there's a lot of different distinctions. And we, we narrowly focused on a few of them, and we know that. Um, but yeah, it would require a long episode to describe the differences and the, the like kind of the tentacles that go out from 1520 um, onwards. Well, and and I think a good way to think of this too, and it tees up this next episode that we have on the docket here um, from this season uh, from Waters is we're all reformed in doctrine. We all go, we all prescribe to what the reformers were pointing back to with scripture, Martin Luther and John Calvin and whatnot. And we're all equally reformed in doctrine it just um, Presbyterian tends to be more of the governmental structure of that particular church. And so, but yeah, all of them have a governmental organization. It just depends on what type. Yep, exactly. So um, it, we, we won't talk much about this, but that's why you'll see uh, confessional Baptist. They prescribe to confessions well, like we, we do. And, you know, whether we agree or not, like there's the term Reformed Baptist, the 1689 and that kind of thing. That's where they're getting that from. Yep. They're saying we're Reformed in doctrine, but we don't believe in being Presbyterian per se. We believe in more. So that's a side bigger conversation, but that's kind of where if there was some sort of distinctive, there is. And so it tees up this episode, which I really liked with Guy Waters, Presbyterian Church Government. Very helpful episode to flush out some and bring to air a lot of maybe misconceptions and bring it out there of like, you know, um, why we don't have uh, female church officers, why, why a woman can't be a pastor. And it's not to be harsh or anything like that. It's just biblically how we're doing that. And we're also saying it doesn't mean women aren't appreciated. That doesn't mean women can't uh, learn theology they still go to seminary school outside of church office privately. They can still teach. They can outside of church um, still, you know, do things that are serving God theologically. They just can't be a pastor, elder, or deacon. Some would, yeah, and, and the OPC would say that the RPC still allows them to be deacons. Okay. Um, so there's, there's, again, there's a little bit of difference between some of the branches um, so it's not saying gotcha. one is yeah overall this, one is overall that. So there's there's some question like, what do we do with Phoebe? What do we do with Priscilla? What do we do with Aquila? Because yeah. um, they're kind of presented as in deacon type roles. So there's some, like the OPC would not say that they're deacons. The RPC, which is under the branch of Nate Park, would say that they're deacons. Okay. Uh, so there's, yeah, there's differences. But uh, yeah, the big one with pastors. And I think we're, I think his, his episode was super helpful. Just clarifying we're, we're not being, um, radically egalitarian or radically complementarian. Mm-hmm. where I think some people might even 
misunderstand where we're coming from on a show. And it's very dangerous to assume too much based on if we, women are allowed to have theological understanding, talk about it by all means. Mm -hmm. We're not saying that they are or should be going up to the pulpit and being a pastor. And um, so I want to kind of leave it there and not try to like talk too much more, but yeah. I don't know if you had any feedback on that as well. No, I think that's good. Yeah, I would, I would just encourage people to listen to the episode for sure. Ex exactly. So, um, so that that episode with Presbyterian Church government is really good. Uh, Christian life with Harrison Perkins, and then Parachurch Church with Erwin Entz. Yep. That's pretty much where. Oh, there's some. There, as we're recording right now, there's some yeah, that we have, haven't been we have published. Almost yet. all of them recorded. Um, and we, we just actually a few days ago finished recording the one. So we were recording this right now, July 22nd. There's one coming out July 25th, but we've already recorded with Justin Holcomb on yeah. counseling the church. Um, that's, oh, that was good. That's, I think that's gonna, that's gonna hit people pretty hard. Um, it's oh, not so wow. much like yeah. reformed church heavy necessarily. I think he, he just nails the heart of Jesus and counseling. Like what, what are we doing? How do we respond to abuse victims? How do we respond to those with whatever various types of baggage they bring into the church? How do church officers counsel them? When do they hand them off? What is actually handing them off look like? Cause sometimes it's just like, no, we just kind of put them off to the professionals and we don't have any more role, but it's actually a team effort. I mean, like if <laughs> that, like all of us in some sense, were tear jerkers. Yeah. And so that's like I that's that episode's gonna, that episode's gonna stick with me for a long time. Um uh, just, mm -hmm. just in his and and Dr. Holcomb's heart in, yeah. in that episode. And I think those, if maybe I can be so bold, those who've gone through abuse, those who've gone for counseling and been spurned in, in some way, shape, or form, I I really sincerely hope when you guys listen to this, you're encouraged. Yeah. Um, you are, you don't listen, you don't like look at the Twitter debates, Instagram debates, the kind of overall church culture on some of this stuff that can leave you wondering like, is there a place in the church for my grief? Is there a place in the church for my abuse? Is there a place in the church for my pastor has gone off with the money or the secretary, whoever it is, how do I deal with some of this stuff? I think you listen to this, you're like, yeah, I think there's a place for me. I think I can, I can talk to my pastor about some of this. It's, I, I, I literally can go on and on and on about that episode. I, I don't think for me, I've, and a, it's like new, like it's we've just recorded that one recently, and so it's raw. I think on all of us, mm -hmm. um, I don't think I have a more favorite episode in the entire history of our podcast besides that mm -hmm. one. That's it is good. That one. Like that one takes the, I, I, I've, I, so I, at admission, I think I told this to our listeners, but I've never listened to our podcast before because I edit it. Um, but that's, so you one, do kind of, you do listen to it by editing it. I do listen to it by editing that's your way. technically, but I've never, I like, I'm not, I'm not actually subscribed to our own podcast because it feels weird yeah, to do yeah. that. Um, but that's one I, I will listen to. Yeah. Reminder, you know, what's beautiful about it? We tend in, uh, I think, kind of a, um, we tend in Reformed churches or just Reformed theologian people tend to be, get a little heady, and that's kind of a yeah. reputation we have, whether it's, it's true it's or not. Yeah, it's, but it's, yeah. I think it's still good to like, like Dr. Holcomb said, like, we should think about the faith. Yeah. There's definitely. no question about it, but yeah, like, yeah, keep going. Well, it's just saying that like, I think this goes to one of the questions on Twitter is like, what could the reformed church do better? And I think we need to, we, we need to walk the walk. You know, we have a lot of knowledge and we know scripture so well in the, as far yeah. as God's church, the big C church. I think we know scripture better than any tradition. And like people cannot like that. I say that, but I, I don't know how you can argue it historically. I think the reformed churches have been, given the gift of like scripture knowledge for sure. No but I think, I think that 
we struggle sometimes to walk the walk. We talk the talk, we know it, we know it, and we close down sometimes. And we need to branch out. And that goes into Ruby Rubio, Rudy Rubio's episode with Reformed Evangelism. That's another episode, our last episode. Really good reminder, we need to get into the urban streets. We need to get into the places people need to be reached. Not just to the, not just the, um, the, like keep redoing where um, the same... uh, like, we like the thing we're not saying and i think people get this wrong about keller but like dr dr tim keller who if you like him, anybody who's listening I, I love dr keller i i think his stuff is brilliant um and what he's doing which he gets a bad rap and i think some people give rubio a bad rep where they focus so much on the city, they focus so much on the urban areas, Dr. Keller in Manhattan, Rubio in South LA, um, us in the central Orange County, like kind of an urban area of Santa Ana. Um, we like, we harp on that, but I think it's because kind of the history of the reformed churches, we like, we do go rural, we do go suburbia, we do go kind of outside the city centers, which we should, there's no Still question. do that, still yeah. do it. Continue, yeah. continue doing that. But like, I, like when I was looking at church planting, when my wife and I were looking at maps and stuff, I was looking at demographic areas. There is literally black holes in urban areas. And I know that there's black holes in suburbia and then rural areas, but sometimes reform people get scared to talk to the people who disagree with them, who like, who see life differently than them, who have a hard background, who don't necessarily have that cookie cutter reform background. Um, and they're like, what do we do with them? How do we talk to them? I have to, I share nothing in common with them. They live in a scary neighborhood. Um, I don't know if I can go there, which I think Rubio, like, I think he nailed it. He's like, he's doing it. And he's, instead of just being a reform guy, who's like, Hey, we should do this. Like if you follow his Instagram, if you follow, like I, I text him weekly and like, we, we like, we jump on calls on a, on a relatively regular basis. Um, the dude just evangelizes, like he just, uh-huh tells everyone he knows about Jesus and about the church. Um, so like he, like really, I mean, I, I'm not sure of anybody else who, like Rubio actually does what he says that he does. Like he actually evangelizes. He actually goes out and tells people about Jesus. Yeah, guys, like we can still be, and we definitely are Calvinistic and believe in predestination and elect, but that doesn't take away the fact that we are called to evangelize. And the Great yeah, Commission, like, we're supposed to go out and do that. I mean, even, you know, there's the command, but there's also like what Paul says in Romans 10. It's how yeah. are they going to hear unless someone tells them? God, yeah. like, God uses means towards his ends. He's not just like, well, I found them. Just kind of sit back in your chair and don't do anything. He's like, he uses people to proclaim his, his good news so that his eternal plan goes forth. Yeah. They're, they're not two mutually exclusive things. One feeds the other. Um, they're, they're, they're inclusive, not exclusive of each other. But like, yeah, I love those. Those are two, like counseling of the church and evangelism are two back-to-back really strong episodes. Yeah, I, well, for whatever reason, God's, way of bringing people and grafting them into his family is having us on the grounds boots on the grounds doing it uh, but he we're not converting people the holy spirit is but we're spreading the gospel inner explaining the gospel to people fellow image bearers knowing that he has already pre-ordained and pre-elected who he's going to choose but we don't that's none of our business we don't know who those people are yep. somebody Somebody you could have preached the gospel to when they were 12 years old could live a life outside of Christ and on their deathbed for some reason, but that was always in their heart and they suppressed it. And then they came to Jesus on their deathbed. And it was because you planted that pebble in their shoe at 12 years old. So don't stop doing that. And I think also going back to Holcomb, going back to he walks the walk, he takes the the information that he's learned about scripture and it is in our heart too the mind and the heart are connected um where he is actually through gratitude 
through knowing he is a Christian and Christ died for him, that he is actually serving people yep. through love. And I think that's what we need to do better at. Yeah. And those, those are actually, even though there's the last two we've reported, there's not the last two in the season. What we end, although we haven't reported them yet, uh, we end with oh. episode 26 with Dr. Brian Lee, which we haven't reported yet, but it's on our docket to do okay. in August. And he's a, he's a pastor in Washington, DC. So he's a reformed pastor. I, I don't know how close he is to DC, but I'm pretty sure you can see the Capitol from his building. Okay. Uh, he's not dissimilar in what he's doing to like Mark Dever in DC. Cause Mark Dever is also in DC as well. I'm almost positive. They know each other. Um, if you guys know Ben Sass, who's oh, a yeah. U.S. Senator, um, he's a member at Dr. At Doctor's Lee, Dr. Lee's church. And I actually think he has a, a bunch of other senators and stuff at his church. He has rocket scientists at his church. He's, he's actually got a ridiculously well-educated church. Uh, but I think he's, he's a great person to ask and, and talk to um, being so close to the political center of America. Uh-huh. How, how do you do this reform theology stuff and not mix it with politics? How, like, how are you in the middle of political America and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, which splits through politics? Yeah, yeah Nick is pointing up <laughs> yeah. politics after Christendom. Um, yeah, how do you do this stuff? So I think, yeah, yeah he's a great it's- person to talk to with Christ and culture. Um, and then we end our season, our season finale before this season finale is a special episode we're going to do with um, Theocast. So if you guys have ever listened to ah. um, Theocast, um, we're going to talk, they're, they're confessional Baptists, we're confessional Presbyterians, and we're yep. going to say kind of ending like a capstone for the season. Okay, you have your confessions, we have our confessions. For the most part, they agree with each other. There's a few bits and pieces that disagree with each other. But like, yep. how do we boost on the ground as Baptists and Presbyterians? How do we approach and do theology do church um recognizing our confessional heritage so we started yeah. with confessions and we're going to end with confessions at the end of season four cool yeah just legit brothers in christ um shoulder to shoulder we go out we evangelize um s- slight differences on some you know some doctrines that could be a little more open-handed mm-hmm. but we believe in i wouldn't salvation. say but yeah that's yeah, like well, I, they're not like salvific issues. They're just that's what I meant. Sorry. Yeah, yeah close handed yeah. because we like we hold them truly, but they're they yeah. do not determine your salvific future. Okay, cool. Good. Thank you for the clarification. They're not <laughs> salvific, they're not keeping one of us. If one of us is wrong, it's not keeping us from being saved. Correct. But yeah. we hold totally. to it close handed, being like, we're very confident this is in scripture. But yeah, I'm um, totally, going yeah, bef- yeah. before we move on to like something I think is really important to underline that. Um, about evangelism and growing the reformed church is we need to keep obviously um keep the reformed churches where they are and organic growth keep baptizing covenant children into the church which means you have one or two parents that are believers and they have a baby you're organically growing the church that way but that's the not the only way that we should be doing it we need to bring be bringing in outsiders like crazy adults baptizing adults yep. that have never been baptized before yep you know so and introducing not people that aren't christian don't we're not we're not a graduate church of christianity we're not yep. like waiting for them to go to a non-denominational church um, and then, okay, you got some of that down. Now you can come over here. We don't, we should not think like that. Cause that's yeah. looking down on other churches. We shouldn't do that. We yeah. need to go in and it's shoulder to shoulder with other Christians that are from other denominations, go out and evangelize. And if they want to come to our church, great. They, they just need to go to a Bible believing church, whether it's a non-denominational church or reformed church, Baptist church, whatever, but we would love them to come to ours. Cause obviously we're pretty dogmatic on certain things. So we need to bring in people that aren't believers that have never been baptized and baptize adults. We also need to bring in people that have strayed away from the church that may have been baptized already. Yep. We can't just keep what well, my point is we can't just keep doing what we're doing and only organic growth through baby baptism and not grow churches in urban areas and not go out and evangelize. Yep. We can't yep. do that. 
I agree. Okay. Yeah. So let's, let's, uh, before we go into season three stuff and talk about best of, I was thinking, yeah. so let's, let's cover, so we have a couple questions that we have on Twitter. I was thinking we do okay. like lightning round. We do quick. You want, if you want to answer first, I'll answer after that, but like quick, short little answers. Um, we're going to, we're going to move through these, we move through these fast. So listeners, if you're in your car and have your seatbelt on, awesome. Keep, keep your seatbelt on. If you're not, find a seatbelt, put it on because we're going to go, we're going to go fast. Wow. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to ask these questions in the order that I see them on our Twitter profile, which I'm pretty sure is the order you see them on your Twitter profile too. Ah, um, yeah. So first one, and like I said in this, I will contact the winner of this. Um, I will DM you if you, if you win this. Um, so you have to, to pay attention. Um, so first one from Ryan Pullman. Uh, how can Sunday school be best structured and utilize, utilize to strengthen the congregation's understanding of who God is, who we are as his people, and what it means to be a Reformed church? So Nick, fast, go. You go first. I don't, <laughs> I don't like being put on the spot. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I would say first and foremost, I think if you can follow the catechisms, I think that's the best. If you're like, oh, that's yeah. too big, um, choose a bite-sized portion of it. So choose like the Apostles' Creed for Heidelberg. It's questions 25 to like 55. Um, the Westminster Confession of Faith has it on the Lord's, or not Lord's Prayer, on the Ten Commandments. Um, so I would choose like bite-sized chunks of it. And then move on from there. Um, I think that's a good starting point for any kind of like Sunday school curriculum before yeah. we move outside of the reform phase. That's that'd be my answer. Yeah, um, I think, like you said, creeds, confessions, catechisms come in so handy. That's why they're there. They're teaching tools. Yep. The Westminster Shorter Catechism is amazing for teaching children too. Yep. And I hear that. I could, I shouldn't assume when I see the word Sunday school, automatically think of just children teaching, but um, children teaching, shorter catechism for a lot of adults. I mean, it's, we should learn that as well, but creeds, catechisms, confessions. We've also had a lot of devotional type of book clubs we've had on that we could refer you to. The Family Worship by uh, Reformation Heritage Books is an incredible book. It will walk you through chapter by chapter a commentary explaining that scripture. Um, we also have had some other uh, Be Thou My Vision mm -hmm. is a fantastic devotional as well. Yeah. I think those are, and then also we've had um, Sally Michael on for a couple of her uh, episodes on her books, Old and New Testament. Um, and it talks about, you know, just educational aspects. So I think Sunday school can be structured with those resources you're better with a, like a structure. I, you know, how it should go to save, you know, based on time. <laughs> yeah. But um, those are just some resources I thought would be good to remind people. Well, cool. this next question is easy. What are y'all's thoughts? This is from Plaz Evans. What are y'all's thoughts on the Heidel stash? I think it's incredible. You should keep yeah. it. I've not even thought it, but I think I think our Scott Clark should uh, keep growing his stash to do that. I'm almost positive it has a Twitter profile, so go follow <laughs> that and learn more. Um, yep. Then another one from Plez Evans. This is more for Reformed Church at Home, but should family worship follow the regular principle of worship as corporate worship should, or is there more play in a structure? I'm more inclined towards the latter. It's more play in the structure. That's not the corporate gathering of God's people. Right. Um, that is you and your family. Uh, I think there's more latitude. Know your, know your children well, know how they learn um be patient with them i don't have any kids so i can i can't speak really to that aspect um i have dogs and cats and i try to catechism but they don't they don't listen to me um that was one yeah. a joke you should you guys should be laughing you guys should be laughing really hard um but uh, so yeah uh, it's it's uh it's yeah more latitude if we spread the regulative principle of worship too far abroad from the church then it's no longer it's no longer for the church. It's like we can make right. it all of life. Um, but I think God's very specific. This is a corporate worship um, structure, not your family worship. Because that assumes you're the pastor of your church or if you're a little small, small seed church, which in a sense that the man in the house is in a sense, but not strictly. Um, so yeah, if we do it too far, right. it flattens it. Um, so yeah, there's, there's play. 
So good point. Kind of reminds me of how to think about Guy Waters' episode on Presbyterian church government. That is a corporate worship. Outside of that, moms, underline moms and dads in family worship, teach your children, mothers as women, again, going outside of the church, by all means, teach them, teach them, teach them. You're there, like to do that. This is gonna get controversial. People may not like teach your husband, like teach your kids. Like that's yeah, this is not a church thing. This is not a sanctioned church event. This is not a Lord's Day of worship. This is you and your kids, you and your husband, the wife and his his wife. This is this is this is uh this is not a defined aspect that the Bible really covers. Um, this is this is lots of latitude. Yep, yeah. So there's like you said, like there's more in play. Um, it's a little, I wouldn't, I'm careful about saying the word casual. It's just I more think it is casual. I think it should be. Yeah. Okay, good. So yeah. it's just not, it's just not this like the corporate governmental rules aren't necessarily in play. Uh, they're not in play They're yeah, It's at they're, play. They're to not be, in play. They're not in play. Um, so like, like the, I keep going back to in corporate worship, we have men as pastors and elders and there's a liturgy set up. It's mm-hmm. it, there's a governance to it to for discipline, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Discipline. Then you have the at home worship, which you don't have to go through a liturgy structure. You could go through devotionals that I mentioned. You just you could do Bible worship. You could have moms teaching it for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, you could just spend the whole time singing or praying or whatever you feel is yeah, appropriate. That's- and I think, yeah, maybe we'll, we'll, before we go to the next question, it's, um, how do I say this? Don't, don't force your kids through dour worship to hate family worship. Right. Um, I'm not saying like, try to make it fun in the fun aspects, but like involve them, do things that they like. Don't like when it comes at night, don't have your kids. And, and I get kids are going to, are going to fret doing a lot of things they don't like. I, like I get that stuff. But as yeah. much as you can, like, make it enjoyable. Make it something the kids want to do. Yeah, and, oh, before we move on, that it's important to know sacraments are done in corporate worship because yeah, you have an order. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Please, please know Doritos and Dr. Pepper <laughs> at home. That doesn't yeah. work. You yeah. need an ordained pastor, bread and wine. That's part of the uh, ordinary means yeah, of bread grace. Bread and wine, not bread and grape juice. Right. The ordinary means of grace, sacraments, corporate worship. Um, if you have Doritos and Dr. Pepper or grape juice at home, it's not for sacraments. It's just for, for a little snack. Yeah. It has nothing to do with ordinary means of grace. And then also more back to women in uh, Sunday school or, or family worship is that's in scripture. I mean, there are women that teach privately and they do that. They do, um, you know, you mentioned Phoebe some other women yeah so. yeah so i think that's some helpful stuff so yeah don't don't spread the church farther than it actually is than what god has ordained because when we don't when we spread it it no longer is the distinctive church mm-hmm. uh, so yeah we'll keep we'll keep that and then next one from kofi adu bohen bohen sorry if i don't know how to pronounce your last name you can let me know i'm sure i pronounce it wrong um but what are the best ways to disciple a congregation that has been used to an inch deep, mile wide, shallow evangelicalism. Mm. And I'm going to say an answer. You're probably not expecting, do it slowly. Um, mm. Do not come in with a fire hose of information and say like, we got to start this. We got to start this now. It's do I mean, do the drip approach, do it nice and slowly. Start with a few people, introduce them, be kind, um, be gentle. And then, I mean, have, to be frank, have like a five to 10 year focus thinking this is, this may come as a shock. This can be hard. Um, but have a, have a long term frame of reference to, to do some of this stuff, because if you start too fast, again, um, it is going to be a fire hose for those who are not used to this. And for most people, a fire hose is not a good experience. That is a lot of information really fast and it could be overwhelming. They could not like it. And I'm not saying they shouldn't not like it. They should like it, but if they're not used to it, it's foreign, it's new. Um, so be be slow yet intentional. Have a plan in place. Expect pushback at some points. 
um, but be, be kind and gentle in how you approach it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that was kind of surprising and wise answer. Just, uh, the way you explained it, I didn't think slow would be initially, but you explained it well, <laughs> I would say I think most Calvinists, most reformed people are like, you better believe what I believe and believe it yesterday. It, well, and you with your personality where you hit home runs or strike out or thrown hard or bean somebody, it kind of goes against your natural instinct too. <laughs> I, I know what natural instincts are. Um, um, yeah, and I'm, I'm used to, I'm, I know my wife and my wife did not like this stuff at first. And so I had to take the long game and I was like, hey, we're going to, we're going to go through it slowly. It's, I, you have to be okay with that. I think my answer too would be something Scott Clark would like that I say is go back to the law gospel distinction. You have to, um, you have to explain what they're saved from. I think, I think a lot of these uh, surface level, shallow evangelism type of uh, churches aren't really teaching the gospel. And if they do, they're not teaching what they're saved from. So I think, I think just getting down to um, explaining scripture, what is sin? Why is sin? Why are we slaves to sin? Why are, why are we born in sin? Where are we saved from? Like, what is God's perfect law? Um, why can't we achieve that on our own? And why do we need a savior? Why, why is Old Testament point to Christ? Why is the New Testament, the New Covenant, and Christ's uh, life, death, and resurrection? So law, gospel distinction. If you don't teach law, gospel distinction, you're on your way to Rome, as Clark, would, Clark said. Um, and it doesn't matter how amazing or impressive your sermon is. If there's no law, gospel distinction, it's not a true uh, gospel sermon. Yep. Cool. Uh, next question. I'll take these together. This is from Lance Crandall. His first is, what role does liturgy play in the discipleship of the believer? And the next is, how can, how can leaning into Catholicity help the Reformed Church moving forward? So first one, what role does liturgy play in the discipleship of a believer? Um, I'm going to assume he's asking this in the context of a church service, of a, like a Lord's Day service. That's my assumption. You can correct me if I'm wrong, um, Lance, if I'm, if I'm wrong in this assumption. Um, I, I don't think there's a better way of discipling a believer. I think we're very used to kind of the evangelical way, which is you bring them to a coffee shop, you go out to eat or whatever it is, and you kind of do one-on-one -on -one discipleship. And um, I, I think your primary means of discipleship is the word and sacrament. Your primary means of discipleship is Sunday morning, Sunday evening, um, gospel preaching, sacraments giving, uh, discipline distributing church. And that is found within a liturgical worship service. And again, everyone has a liturgy. So it's found through a well-structured and I think uh, a great, so both um, Adriel Sanchez and we had Jonathan Cruz on beginning of June to talk about his books. And I think he does a good job of, of answering some of these questions too. Um, but your discipleship starts kind of ends, but kind of comes from the service through, through the rest of the week. And so your believer, uh, will be discipled through the liturgy. And I think whether they consciously know it or not, um, you are still being discipled in, in your service. So a well-structured service will over months and over years, slowly start changing how your mind thinks, how your heart feels, and you'll start thinking scripturally. You'll start thinking in these distinctions. Start, you'll start praying how the Lord's Prayer has taught us. You'll start praying as the saints have been praying in the past. Um, you will think of the sacrament differently. And as Dr. Perkins talked about with the Christian life, it flows from Sunday. You think of Sunday as like the heavy lifting day. It's, it's where you go for for a mass attempt at a lift, which makes the rest of the week a lot easier. Those are percentage pieces. I know people may not know what I'm talking about. It's like, it's, it's weightlifting talk for saying, you know, really hard in competition and you train for it kind of throughout the week. And so that's something you want to maybe think about where um, that's how the liturgy kind of helps develop the believer. And then um, Catholicity helping the reformed church moving forward. Uh, that's small C church. Yeah. That's crazy confessions. There's a bunch of different resources for this one. Um, that's 
we reform church while I do believe we have the purest gospel. I didn't say only gospel. I said the purest. Um, we are helped immensely from our brothers and sisters across the world who do not share the same um, ecclesiastical preferences that we do, um, but are doctrinally the, the core of it they, they, they share with us. So um, if we are too siloed off in our own tribes, we forget that the broader church exists. And when we forget the broader church exists, we can tend to think well, we have it and nobody else does. Um, and when we may have the purest expression of it, there's hues and hints and tints of the diamond that we're missing. And I think those are things that we can get from the broader church. You're muted. I, I do think that the um, Holy Spirit has given church churches um, special gifts and uh, we don't need to spend a lot ton of time like digging into those, but it's just a reminder of appreciation for some denominations, like you just said, that might do some things uh, before our time better than we do. Mm -hmm. um, but at, as a low, small C Catholic unifying church, creeds, can, creeds and confessions and catechisms, um, obviously the things that are more reformed in doctrine are the confessions and catechisms, but the creeds mm -hmm. are lower, small c. And I know we're we're not, you know, in agreement with the Roman Catholic Church. We make that pretty clear as Reformed people, but it is like they, they do some things right. Like yeah, shocker. It's there's 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 a stupid. I'll say stupid. There's a stupid Twitter debate on if the Roman Catholic church gets justification wrong, which they do, they absolutely get justification wrong, totally, yeah. completely wrong. But that does not affect other doctrines. Yes, I get the, the fact that they get justification wrong and it has downstream effects. There's no question about it. But Catholic church, especially Aquinas, nails theology proper. And we like, like it or not, we have our modern categories of who God is from Aquinas. Whether, whether yeah. you know it or not, whether the theologians that you follow or not, you get it from him. It's, but, if you get it, he gets the language from Aristotle, who's not a Christian, regardless of whatever people think of him or not. But he gets the language of him and says, oh, that's really helpful language. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show how this language helps us better think about God. Um, that's, it takes intellectual humility to realize mm -hmm. you're not in the church. Yeah, and the doctrine of the Trinity is a good example. Yeah, you would. Have, I've been reading have, Augustine's Confessions in the morning. Um, he does not talk how contemporary Reformed people talk. There's, there's, there's no doubt about that. Um, but you, all, you can see original sin. You can see Trinity. You can see a lot of the stuff in his, in his writings. Um, mm -hmm. I, yeah, I, I, I would just encourage Christians to read the Catholic Church. Read their doc, even if you disagree with it. Read it. It's, it's not going to hurt you. You're not going to be a closet Catholic theologian maybe one quarter of my reading is stuff I disagree with, but it forces me to think better about my tradition um, than thinking like I'm the only one. Well, if you're confident in what you know, but humble enough in what you don't know, you will read other sources. Yep. Absolutely. And, and, and I think so for creeds, the apostles creed, the Nicene creed, the Athanasian creed, the Chalcedonian, um, the, uh, those are, really good small c um Chris, and by the way this book by uh edited by chad van dixhorn you guys should get it's from crossway mm -hmm. and um i going back to your earlier the earlier question discipleship of the believer through the liturgy i think being in a service uh in the in the pews um i think our responsibility is response to our holy god we're on holy ground and we are hearing the message of salvation and we're hearing a law gospel distinction. And the way the liturgy is set up is the preaching of the word and uh, the assurance of pardon and law gospel distinction, us responding to that in Thanksgiving as well. 
And that's where the Psalter hymnal comes in. We respond in singing and praise and prayer and the sacraments. Mm, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, so we probably should, I should, I should probably answer these a little bit quicker. Um, <laughs> okay. So uh, OHP says order of holy prax. I don't know your name, but at least your Twitter handle. Um, so it's kind of history question. What elements of the Reformed Church can be seen in the pre-Reformed Church? I, I would say all of them. Um, if you read pre-Reformers, if you read uh, the Apostolic Fathers, early church fathers, you, like it's not a better way. Like you see them all. Um, you see the two sacraments. You see preaching the gospel. You see church discipline. You see the order. We basically see the Reformers. Uh, an analogy that the Reformation is akin to washing your face. You're washing the face. Your face is always there. It's striking to me. I know it was washed, but will remain historically speaking. Yeah, I think that's a it's a fair analogy. I know what would you what would you say? Yeah, I mean, I would have nothing of value to add to that. I agree with you, and it's just for <laughs> sake of time. I don't think I would try to fumble anything, but yeah, good answer. Uh, then Felicity Zeman says, "Woman who look feminine with short hair, and men that look masculine with long hair, Beach Boy style." Also, head covering for women. I, I think, yeah, I think women can look feminine with short hair, and I think men can look masculine with long hair. Um, also, it's extremely culturally conditioned. Um, we in Western cultures tend to have different hairstyles than those in Eastern cultures. And I think if we champion one over the other, um, you kind of neglect history and you kind of neglect other cultures besides yourself. Is it getting a little legalistic to think that someone would have to do some of these things in order to be honoring worship? I think so. I mean, again, this depends on your context. If you you know your own heart when you're doing some of this stuff, and so if you're doing it for a specific reason, then there's that comes to one thing. Uh, but if you're part of a certain culture and the culture practices something, then I think there is something to say about like, kind of take on cultural values in some sense whether whether you know it or not yeah and what where in scripture it mentions that you know if don't tell somebody what they can or can't eat you know if they feel conviction of to not eat something that's in you know helping their own heart or to eat something you know you know what part i'm talking about with paul yep, yeah yep. yeah it's romans 14 yeah. um yeah so that's i think that's that'd be helpful and head covering for women um if I can find the article, I can post it. Dr. Um, Stephen Ball, we had him on for season two. Uh, the best article I've ever read on head covering. And it covers mm. the pagan practice around head covering, why Christians covered their head in um, apostolic times. I won't give the whole argument now, but it has to do with distinguishing between pagans when they're walking into the temple and Christians when walking to the synagogue um, right. around head covering. So I'll, I'll link to that, that article. Um, without saying more, but that's the really difficult one to go through. But real quick, just so we know, like, is, are you telling women that all of a sudden next Sunday on service, they need to start coming with head coverings? So just make it clear. If they want to wear it. If they don't want to, you're not obligated. Okay, cool. Perfect yep. answer. Um, what's the reformed church greatest room for improvement? Holy smokes. That is a massive question. Uh, from <laughs> well we answered uh, some of it we did from jeremy Baker. baker sorry if i yeah. don't know how to say, say your name um but i guess is your jeremy backer because you have two k's maybe you're jeremy baker i don't know but evangelism helping with church yeah. planting anything else I, I i like i think that's just for me i i think the number one thing the reformed church again this is just me this is not my assessment of the whole thing um, we need more of them. I think that's number one thing. We need more of them, and I think there's I think there's just downstream effects of that. But we just need more reformed churches. I think there's mm -hmm. no better way. We need ten times, fifty times more. Um, we just need more. Well, I would say too. Um, we talk a lot about the Reformed Church not being very diverse, but I think that's like an American thing, too, because outside of uh, the U.S., um, well, there's a lot of Korean Reformed denominations, and, and in Africa, 
um there's reformed mm-hmm. is doing very well right yep um the chinese, churches and i chinese reformed church is big yeah there's a lot and i would say like the opc denomination i'm in does a pretty well good job with missions overseas um i know there's some missions overseas but i would say like here in the u.s going back to our earlier part of the conversation, get into the more of the newer areas that the Reformed Church hasn't been in, some of these urban areas and stuff, um, to get more diversification I- inside the country. Yeah, I agree. Um, that one's not a question. How important are the sacraments in keeping the true church? Number two, Mark. So extremely important. Yeah. <laughs> Deal. Sure. Deal breaker. Deal breaker. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. If you don't, uh, there's I mean, like churches can. I think churches can rightly argue on how often you have the Lord's Supper. I'm yeah. biblically, historically, theologically convinced of um, every week you have the Lord's Supper. I think there's no better way of showing who believes in Christ besides the Lord's Supper. Um, so I think the Belgian Confession is helpful with the three marks. I think the Westminster Confession is better on sacraments um, because it says there's a continuum of truer churches that that practice these more pure uh, i think it's more helpful language in understanding this so yeah that's they're extremely important um if you could have all your congregants we'd w- read one chapter from any book in your library <laughs> what it what would it be and why um, that's, that's yeah one chapter I'm trying to think. Um, I think, oh boy, there's so many. I, I would say there's a, it's one of the hardest books I've ever read in my entire life. But one of the chapters in Dr. Horton's, we haven't had him on for this one. I don't think Nick has read this one. Uh, we had to read it for Westminster, was his book on people and place. It's a, an extremely technical book on ecclesiology, but it's gold. I, I've, I haven't read a better chapter. There's probably easier chapters in other books, but that's the best chapter I think I can read. Yeah, and I think you and I have literally hundreds and hundreds of books um, through doing this podcast, so it's almost an impossible question to answer, but I would say... I, I did see that question before recording. So I grabbed a couple of books that I just feel that I just kind of go to more. And then ones that are pop out. I'm going to reference Covenant Theology book, Crossway, RTS, um, so our whole season three we walked through. I think you guys, I think something that's crucially helpful for churches right now is chapter six, the Abrahamic covenant, and then chapter seven, the Mosaic covenant. You guys buckle down those two chapters. If you know that inside and out, that will help tremendously understanding the rest of scripture, knowing Mm -hmm. the Abrahamic covenant, you know, pretty much Genesis 12 to 17, the Abraham story. um, And then the Mosaic covenant, there's a lot of questions still of like, is it still in play? Is it totally nullified? If it is, you know, there's a lot of, um, you know, just, that will help tremendously. I also think this isn't, this is kind of going broader than a chapter, but you know, I do think how Jesus runs the church Mm. by Guy Waters is helpful. And maybe if I just had to pick one chapter, it says, what is the church? And maybe the conclusion of that book, but he, it's a pretty easy book, pretty quick to read. Um, That will pretty much cover a lot of like what we've talked about in this season. Um, I would also more than one chapter. (laughs) I know. But no, it's hard. I mean, I'm currently yeah. reading Politics yep. and Chris- After Christendom by David Van Druden, which is huge in helping understand that the Noahic covenant is still in effect. It's a non-redemptive covenant. And that's the reason why we kind of look at, um, you know, we can separate the church and the state in a certain aspects, yep. you know, it's like the Noahic covenant. And so, you know, I don't want to ramble too much. There's always also more, but, you know, yeah, I like I like I like those answers. Um, Kristen Molnix asks, "How long should your sermon be?" Um, I I know there's all this debate on like should it be ten minutes and should it be an hour. I do think this is a pretty happy zone around thirty minutes. Um, there are I can't think of a pastor 
who's who's uh, gifted enough to preach longer than 30 minutes. Um, if you get somebody who's preaching for an hour, that dude better be ridiculously gifted and ridiculously interesting because I will fall asleep in 20 or 30 minutes myself. Um, I, one of the, the best book I've ever read on preaching, I can kind of, maybe a modern book I've ever read on preaching is T. David Gordon's Why Johnny Can't Preach. Uh, I've read, I've read that book three times, hmm. um, in the past year, because there's not a better book on modern preaching and he nails current reform preaching. Um, cause most reform preachers, they're good. They're just not great. And the goal should always be to be better and better and better preacher. Um, but he makes the case, most reform preachers go way too long because they're not interesting and they're not coherence. The sermon doesn't make sense. It's not, it's not unified by a single concept. It's not from scripture. You're still kind of jumping off scripture. So I would say 30 minutes. I know most reform people will say like, go as long as you can, but most people are just not gifted enough to do it. I, I know for a fact, I'm not gifted enough to go longer than 30 minutes. So my average sermon length is like 30 to 33 minutes. Um, so I think that's how you do it. But yeah, what do you think, Nick? I'm uh, probably the wrong person to ask. I'm not a pastor, but I would agree that anything over 30 minutes, I would, my mind would start wandering because yeah. it's probably at that point drawn on too long. Um, yeah. So. And I know like, I know people use the argument that Puritans went for an hour and I know they went for an hour, but Puritans are way better than you are. Um, if you get to the point where you're as good as William Perkins at preaching, go for an hour but you're not as good at William Perkins. You're not as good at C.H. Spurgeon. You're not as good as John Calvin. Don't go for an hour. Go, go for 30 minutes, hit your sweet spot. Yeah, I mean, I'm never, I'm not technically watching the clock on our, our sermons, but I know my pastor, whether it's over 30 minutes or not, I think he has a sweet spot. And I think that's part of the, and he's good. Um, so I think that's part of the, the liturgy structure of the Reformed Church keeps some things in bounds, too, where people aren't really able to run on and go outside their bounds too much. Yep. Uh, oh, oops. I, uh, so Alex McEwen asks a lot of questions. Um, so we'll answer, I'll answer the first one pretty fast. And Nick, I think you'll probably agree. Uh, he asks, we often say that within the new covenant, the Decalogue is nor normative to the modern believer. How should that play out in the local church setting? How should the local church enforce that? What about families? Um, I mean, it's the Decalogue is the moral law. It's, we no longer have the ceremonial. We don't have the judicial. So if they right. break the moral law, then they're disciplined. I don't, I don't know how else the church um, will do it. Then if like, how else do you discipline other than knowing what they broke? So yeah, the moral law is still in effect. Yeah, so, so it doesn't condemn them. So we're not saying that unless they're unrepentant and it's very clear that they're not a believer, but they're under discipline. Um, how about families? You don't do it as the church does it. A family does not discipline how the church disciplines. Family disciplines how a family disciplines. I think this goes back to the um, regular principle of worship and families. Um, the family is not the church. I, people may not like that I say that, but it's not. The church, the church, family may be an extension of the church, but it's not the church. Yeah. Um, how much of a creed should a local church expect its members to hold? If we're talking apostles, Nicene, and Athanasian, the entire thing. I don't. Yeah. I don't know how you can get away from it. Um, I know the OPC. You have to affirm the apostles. Um, the URC, as far as I know, is full subscription. Um, yeah, you have to, you have to confirm the creeds because if you don't, either you don't believe in the Trinity or you don't believe in Jesus' divinity. Exactly, and it's a it's there for a reason. It's a summary of Scripture, and they were careful about how they wrote the creeds, every word, and so there's not too much room for error to disagree on. And I'm not saying the creeds are infallible. That's not what I'm saying. Um, I'm just saying they confess the faith better than you do. And they confess the faith better than you do. And basically everyone pre-1800 had to abide by the creedal standards. I don't see why we're different. 
Here, here's a side note that's helpful for that question too, though. Um, who was the episode we had on uh, Christ's ascension to the uh, uh, dead? Matt Emerson. So that's helpful understanding in one of the creeds where the, in the creed where it talks about he, him going into hell. So in your creed, you will hear, you know, he, he descended into hell, but there is some discussion on, does that ne- literally mean the hell we're talking about or just death, dead, shul? So just side note. Yep. Uh, are there are some parts that are more important. I wouldn't say more important, I would just say that are uh, first order salvific. Yeah. Um, there's some of the third order and you don't have to, I wouldn't say even believe. I would say there are certain parts that a Christian should have a deeper theological knowledge of. And there are some that there's more latitude for how much knowledge you have of it. Um, officers are hold to a different standard. So they have to know it very well and very deeply. Members are not hold to that standard. They have to hold to it, but they may not have the depth. Well, and it's a small C Christian church, small C Catholic Christian church belief where it unifies us. And, and if you, that's why an LDS Mormon, you're talking to them and they don't believe what we say in the creeds, we could we say, I'm sorry, you're based on that, based on you not believing in a Trinity uh, you can't call yourself Christian. Yep. Yeah. And then his next question is, can one spouse hold more rigidly to a creed than the other? And how should that be reconciled? I, I don't see why they couldn't um, hold more rigidly. And how can that be reconciled? But my guess is that should be covered in marriage counseling before you get married. And if that's after you get married, then talk to a church officer, um, do a Bible study, look through the history of it and, and figure out why something is not being held firmer than another. And is it really a big deal um, in your marriage? Um, if, it's, if it's kind of a scruple on like what Nick said, is this like, oh, did Christ is in or did not? It's, I, I don't think that's a, it's a, it's a debate you should be having that really kind of separates you in your marriage. Um, there are some things that yeah. should, but that should not. Um, yeah. Alex Wright says, why do you think so many reformed Baptist churches lack experiential preaching. Then he gives some examples. Um, to be honest, I don't think either Nick or I are qualified to know because neither of us have ever been to Reformed Baptist Church. Um, so that's probably a better question to ask. Reformed Baptist has been to a lot of churches. Yeah, that would be a good question for when we have the Theocast on. Yeah. Maybe. Um, but I mean, the closest thing I could think of is like the non denominational churches I've been a part of which are independent, but they are Calvinistic. So they would be a little bit more like appreciating reformed doctrine, but independent in the fact that their ecclesiastical approach is a non-denominational church. That's the closest. Yeah, I, I have a mental enough to know like yeah. who's good at preaching, who's not. So it's, I want to yeah, be, yeah, so, I want to be humble enough to say like, I, I just don't know. Yeah, we don't know. So we'll, uh, then it kind of follows up. Not a question. Um, Seth Webb. Second to last question, how does one aid their church in moving from old Southern Baptist polity to Reformed Baptist polity, especially when their lead uh, pastor isn't on board? Uh, I mean, I, I'll start, none of us are Reformed Baptist, so we can't really speak to that, but I, I, I would venture to guess it's not different than how we, or somebody asked us um, how to change a church from inch deep, mile wide to mile deep, also mile wide. Um, my Guess is do it slow. Well, and as you guys are listening to this episode, we have not recorded the Theocast yeah. pod- show yet. I think we should have them help us answer that question. Yeah, and it's I don't I don't there's not a magic bullet. So it's it's not yeah. like if you do this, this will happen. Um, each church is different. And again, there's if you're yeah. if your lead pastor is not on board. I'm not, I'm not sure there's much you can do. There's, yeah. It's, I would say if that's, if it's enough of a thing where if you feel convicted to maybe if you know that your pastor is not changing and it's important to you, maybe that's a sign to look at another church. Yeah. I, I think that's fair. Talk to them, but yeah, yeah. it's fair. Um, 
David Oreskovich. I guess that's how you say your name. Um, yeah. Which reformer of old would you want to preach for you <laughs> this Sunday? Um, Ooh, I know. Calvin? I don't know. That's, I think he's the best. Oh, yeah. I was <laughs> hands down, Calvin. I've I mean, read not- enough of his sermons to know, like, the dude knew his people, loved them, and preached well. There, I would say, okay, so we're going to both say Calvin. Let's just say that that would be the, the, the trump card that we would say Calvin. I would say, if I can't say Calvin, I'd say Machen. Have you read his sermons before? No, but I have the, um, ah, what book is it from? I don't, the, I don't think he ever preached. Um, the, the, his um, Mr. seminary thing, yeah. book that has all his talks. Yeah, I, but we've I'm had a lot can, of. Somebody can, somebody can um, let me know. I don't think he ever preached. I, he was just a professor. Mm. Um, most of the Prince's uh, seminary professors are not very good preachers. Uh, um, besides Gerhardus Voss, who was a fantastic preacher, and he preached like 15 times in his life total. Gotcha. So Nothing. I would say I would say my answer is probably bad then. So if I can't pick Machen and you picked Voss, I'll just say you picked Voss. No, uh, I, I mean, I'll, I'm going I'm to say Calvin. I'm going to go with Trump. Well, we both, we both agree oh, Calvin. I I'm just saying. If you can't I, would, say Calvin. I wouldn't say Voss. He doesn't have a big enough a record. Okay. Um, well, who, why don't you go first? I probably, I know I'm going to miss somebody really cool that we've had an episode with that are just like, no way, that would have been awesome. But I'd probably say Luther. Okay. Martin Luther. I'm trying to think who would, I would say, you know, I would actually, cause he's got 40 years under his belt. I'd say Francis Turton. Ooh, uh, yeah. I've read his institutes. I've read a, I've read a book of his sermons. Cause some of his sermons are published though. Most of them are in French. Um, he was, he was gifted. I would listen to him. Oh, I would say, oh, here's a wild card to this. Um, reformer, does that mean first or second generation? Or could it mean somebody like R.C. Sproul? Yeah, I, yeah, I, I can say R.C. Sproul. I'd, yeah. I would say R.C. Sproul. But yeah. if, I, I assume this guy's thinking first, second generation. Oh, I'd go Calvin, Luther, one of those guys. Cool. But Sproul would be sweet. Yeah, he would be sweet. Yeah, he's, he, was a, he was a gifted guy. Cool. Well, that's Q and A. We'll have another one in what a year? Nine months. Six months. After season five. Um, so Nick, he has yeah. these. I don't have these in front of me. Yeah. What were our top five episodes from season three? So season three was promises and fulfillments. Again, we walked through chapter per episode of the Covenant Theology book published by Crossway and Reformed Theological Seminary faculty. So this. Um, the lineup of that top five episodes. So go from so, fifth to first. Okay, cool. And I think there was 27, 28 episodes. They're all great, that, obviously. Yeah. But, and this isn't our picks of which are favorite. This is just the most downloaded. To. Yeah. Yeah. From what we could tell with our limited data. <laughs> yeah. Understanding. Yeah, we don't have much data. Yeah. But yeah. So what maybe we it's tell. off. Maybe what it's was? off. Maybe if it's off here or there. But number five would be, uh, Covenant and Second Temple Judaism. Interesting. That was just you and I. I know. Huh. All right. People want to know about Second Temple Judaism. So there you go. That's number five. Yep. Number four was Covenant of Works in the Old Testament. Okay. I think that was also just us too. Yeah, because one of them had Fesco. He wasn't that been... one, I think. No. Um, um, huh. Interesting. All right. Number three. Adam and the beginning of the covenant of grace. Okay. I also think that was just us too. <laughs> Interesting. People like listen to, to just us. I'm, I'm kind of surprised and shocked at that. Yeah. Uh, number two, ancient Near Eastern. Um, sorry, I can't read my own handwriting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's ancient Near Eastern backgrounds. Oh, backgrounds. My backgrounds is all scribbly. Ancient Near Eastern backgrounds to covenant. That's also just us. My goodness. Well, number one is not just us. And I, I, I'm assuming I know what number one is. but And I won't let you say his name because you're going to mess. <laughs> I'm just giving you a hard time. That's, that's shocking that our two through five are us. Um, but again, we're not like making stuff. We're just going through the covenant theology textbook. 
So that's, that was, I mean, those are, what's kind of funny is those are not like four topics that I think people typically associate with covenant theology. They're kind of like different niche subjects. So maybe people just wanted to get to, to niche subjects. So cool. What's, what's number well, one? And I, uh, number one is Ligon Duncan covenant of <laughs> that's, that's early. Not a shocker. Yeah. Yeah. Covenant in uh, the early church. Yeah. Uh, that's so the early a... church fathers, how they, how they talked about the early church fathers, how they, the boss uh, just talking about how they. Uh, I, I know he shared covenants. that one too. So that one got a bump in listeners that ours <laughs> wouldn't necessarily get. Um, yeah, that was, that was really. But right, rightfully so. I mean, he's yeah. way better than we are. Well, yeah. But, um, people don't know. Dr. Duncan got his doctorate on, I, I think his topic actually was, his dissertation topic at Edinburgh was on patristic covenant theology. So early church fathers, yeah. like that's his, that's his thing. Like that's, that's what he's most educated in is covenant theology and early church fathers. So it makes sense. Yes. So you'll hear some names um, of, of how reformers point back to these early church fathers, but the early church fathers point also back to scripture. So we're all reformers or early church fathers yeah. and scripture are all in agreement on things. I'm going to ask Nick and, he's not prepared for. That's, that's why I'm oh asking. No. <laughs> that's why I'm asking. Yeah. You're going to edit. Because Nick edit always asks whatever me I'm not prepared for. So if you remember, who were the church fathers that Dr. Duncan talked about? Um, Arrhenius. I would say you you pronounce it uh, Irenaeus. Irenaeus. Um, Latin his name. Justin Martyr. Yep. Barnabas. Barnabas. Yep. Um, Clement is another big one. Clement, first Clement. Uh, yeah. Um, Justin Martyr. I already said Justin Martyr. Am I missing thinking of somebody Polycarp. else? Oh, Polycarp was a big one. Yep. Um, Ignatius. Yep. That was a big one. Um, yeah, I think we named them all. Yep. Yeah. Those, so that's, if you guys want to learn, yeah. Covenant theology is not a new thing. It's not like 1500s. Yeah. All of a sudden, um, Johannes Oklampadius, who's the first one people think created this. Um, he's like the 1520s, 1530s. He's actually reading the church fathers. And he's like, oh, I guess covenant theology is not a new thing. So when he brings this up, he's like, oh, yeah, if you want to read these guys, go to talk to them. Uh, mm. If you read the epistle to Barnabas, it's like reading Calvin. It's, it's crazy because the epistle to Barnabas was written 130 to 150 AD. Um, it's like reading a contemporary covenant theologian. And you're like, huh, this has an old pedigree. The church fathers are reading the Bible the same way we do today. Nice. Yeah. No, oh, that, that episode was really good. It was. Um, so what is next? Are we talking about? Yeah, last um, one to talk next, about is season five. Season five, yeah. It's and a we, super long episode. <laughs> <laughs> We've already announced it on Twitter, and we'll, we'll go pretty short on this. Okay. <laughs> but season five is Reformed Apologetics. Yeah. So you guys are not Sorry. on, yeah, if you guys are not on Twitter, um, yeah, Reformed Apologetics. So we're going to dive into um, what that is the canon of scripture, how that came about, critical issues in scripture that you'll hear from those who don't like the Bible. They'll bring these things up. So we're going to have literally the world's top experts. Yeah. And each one of these talk about it. Um, and we'll do, we'll do uh, world religions. We're going to have experts in the world's largest religions come on, talk to us about those religions. So we're going to hear from people who actually know those religions, whether they practice themselves or whether they researched it on what yeah. they actually believe. So when you guys talk to your friends who might believe this stuff, you guys will actually know what they believe versus like guessing what they believe. Yeah. Um, and we're, we're going to have, and we're going to have um, one of the best apologists that's reformed Michael Kruger on again. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had a book club with him on uh, surviving religion one on one, which is he, all his works are so apologetic focused and he knows scripture so well he's explaining like defending canon scripture um 
you know, reliable canon scripture explaining that stuff. But we're we're doing stuff that you would predict would be on a um, apologetics season, like that kind of stuff. But also, we're going to dip into topics that are really touchy and mm-hmm. serious, like abortion. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, praise God, we had an answered prayer that Roe versus Wade was overturned uh, on the federal level. Amazing. So uh, we're going to talk about just how how to kind of talk to other people that aren't Christian about this stuff in a loving way, rather than trying to, you know, be judgmental and whatnot. Yeah. So and the, um, the, the it's whole helpful thing, conversations. Yeah. And the whole thing behind this is it's its primary focus is to give you both more knowledge, but just a better understanding of some of these things. So when it comes to abortion, when it comes to science, when it comes to kind of like ancient philosophy, all these things that play a big role, um, a lot of us come into conversations without knowing some of these things. And our hope is we, when we have these experts on who provide you information, we're going to have a lot of resources, uh, that you'll have a better understanding of it. And then you can talk through your better understanding. So it's not just to like talk to your friends, it's actually for you too. Like for, for yeah. you listening, first and foremost, it's like, so you better understand, you know, um, like talk about the video, like what is abortion? Like we're going to have three medical experts on um, from the largest institute in the world talking about abortion issues actually tell us what it is. And it's going to be hard, but it's actually going to tell us what it is, what it isn't, how the ruling either changes things or doesn't change things. And they're going to, they're going to provide some, some fuel. Um, so yeah, we're going to have a bunch of different experts on biblical studies, world religions, philosophy, um, big ticket items, big questions for Christianity. And then with all this stuff, how do we actually interact? How do we yeah. use this knowledge now to talk to our friends um, and better understand ourselves why we believe what we believe? Yeah. Yeah. And just for the record, so you guys are listening, um, for the record, we are pro-life, definitely. So if we're going to be talking about people say, you know, just so we, even though, um, this is getting past just having the typical predictable talking points, which, which are the other side of the aisle can see coming a mile away and combat. They have their own like response already. It's, it's, it's having the ammo, not in the thinking that we're going to war, trying to win an argument, but trying to win the person and just like having reasons why we have these talking points. What's the deep layers. Um, it's, it comes down to a heart issue too. So yeah, so like, and and an abortion is not the only thing we're going to be talking about. So it's exactly. a big thing. Um, yeah. But we'll, like, we'll the flow will go biblical studies to world religions to philosophy to um, big questions for Christianity. Um, so we're hoping this flow helps you kind of build up to some of these things. And when you hear a scholar say, "Well, we got the canon in like 400 AD." And so like the church chose it. You can say, actually, that's, that's actually not what happens. Um, when you read this, when people tell you this, or Christianity, Christianity is not that different from Islam, or Christianity is not that different from kind of this new age stuff. And we can all believe the same stuff. And actually, that's, that's, that's actually not what happened. Let me, let me help you better understand this stuff. And it's for you when like you hear this stuff, you're not freaking out and saying like, well, yeah. that's never covered in church. Or that's, I've never heard this before. Or that's totally new to me. Um, like my, my primary mission is to, to build the listener up and then they can go out and better engage with the world. Yep. No, that's good. Um, excited for that to happen. And yeah, we got a personally a busy couple months coming up. I'm, uh, my wife and I are expecting our second child in mid-October. Um, just started, going to be starting a new job here very soon Mm. and you're been busy church planting um and 
you got a new puppy and our official animal mascot of our podcast should be a black lab because both of us have a black lab it's, although i think yours is pure black lab mine is not mine's not a pure black lab he's a he's like a he's got like a mix of collie and pit in him i think okay yeah. our, our our logo would be a black lab even though really technically neither of our dogs are black labs they just look the they just primary, look. their dominant trait comes out as looking like a black lab <laughs> which is funny because my dog is only 25 percent black lab yeah he's 50 percent golden retriever and he looks nothing like a golden retriever and he's 25 percent poodle and he looks nothing like a poodle Let's see if here come here for the youtube audience come here <laughs> yeah if you guys want to see mine he's he's my oh. boy yep mine's sleeping i took him on a long walk so he's sleeping here's my boy there you go He's in uh, almost every, almost every recording. He's kind of right. next to me. Cool. Well, this is our longest episode ever. Hope you guys yeah. enjoyed it. Got some bearings. Um, after this episode, we're going to have five episodes, our best of series. So when you guys heard of our top five episodes for season three, we're going to replay those episodes for those who are new to our show. Okay. Uh, if you guys are um, old to the show, it's just a good refresher. And then season five starts October, looking at October 3rd. So season five, October 3rd, very first episode. It'll go through April 10th of next year. Wow. Cool. Yep. All right. It's pretty much going from my second kid's birth to both yours and my birthday. That's the right. The following year. Yep. Long period of time. Cool. Well, if you guys cool. have any questions, want to reach out, um, all the information that Nick shared at the beginning of this episode was relevant for that stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. Hope you guys enjoyed season four. We loved recording it, and we are we like we could not be more excited to start recording and, and publishing season five, um, and enjoy the best of season three. So we'll yep. see you guys next week. Actually, no, we won't see you guys next week. We'll see you in about a month when uh, yeah. when season five starts recording. All right. Peace.